We present What Ho Jeeves by P.G. Woodhouse. Starring Michael Horton as Jeeves and Richard Byers as Bertie Worcester. With Vivian Pickles as Aunt Dahlia and Stephen Moore as Tuppy Glossop. Young Tuppy. Every year, starting about the middle of November, there's a good deal of anxiety and apprehension among owners of a better class of country house throughout England as to who will get Bertram Worcester's patronage for the Christmas holidays. It may be one, or it may be another. As my Aunt Delia says, you never know where the blow will fall. This year, however, a short straw had been drawn by Sir Reginald Witherspoon, Bart, of Bleaching Court, Upper Bleaching, Hans who, having married Aunt Dahlia's husband's younger sister, Catherine, is by way of being a sort of uncle of mine. But on the eve of my departure for the Witherspooneries, I found Jeeves in my bedroom, wading knee-deep in suitcases and shirts and winter suitings, like a sea beast among rocks. What her, Jeeves? Packing? Exactly, sir. Pack on, pack Jeeves, pack with care, pack in the presence of the passenger. <laughs> Tra-la! I'm in a merry mood. Yes, sir. I had already designed this much. I must say I'm looking forward to these festivities, Jeeves. In the first place, the Bart does one extraordinarily well, both browsing and sluicing being above criticism. And in the second place... Yes, sir? Were you aware that when we arrive at Bleaching Court, we will find young Tuppy Glossop among those festivities? Uh, no, sir? Yes, Jeeves. That black-hearted bird will be on the fence, and I may as well tell you I am planning a hideous vengeance for him. Vengeance, sir? Jeeves, remember that night a few months ago when I returned home ringing wet? Certainly. <laughs> it happened at the Drones Club, Jeeves. After dinner, when he got me in a sporting mood with a bottle of the ripest, this man of wrath, Glossop, betted me I couldn't swing myself across the swimming bath by the ropes and rings. <laughs> a childish feat for one of my listeners. So I, I took him on, exulting in the fun, so to speak. When I'd done half the trip and was going as strong as Jacket, I found he had looped the last rope back against the rail, leaving me no alternative but to drop into the depths and swim ashore in correct evening costume. Most unfortunate. The crime of the century, Jeeves. Which is why I hope you are not forgetting to pack the giant squirt and the luminous rabbit. I will include the objects, if you so wish. Uh -huh. Good. I'm rather pinning my face on the luminous rabbit. You wind it up and put it in somebody's room in the night watches. See? And it shines in the dark and jumps about, making odd squeaking noises all the while. <laughs> the hope for must be, I should imagine, well Catholic to scare young puppy into a decline. Very possibly, sir. Ah, I expect that's Aunt Delia. She phoned that she'd be calling this morning. Very good, sir. Telegram, mister. Thank you. A telegraphic communication, sir. Oh, what did he say, Jeeves? Handed in at upper bleaching, sir. Uh, <clears throat> when you come tomorrow, bring my football boot. Also, if humanly possible, Irish water spaniel, urgent regards, Tuppy. Uh. What the blame does that mean? What do you make of it, Jeeves? It would appear to be from Mr. Glossop, sir. As I interpret the document, he wishes you, when you come tomorrow, to bring his football boots. Also, if humanly possible, an Irish water spaniel. He hints that the matter is urgent and sends his regards. Uh. That's what I thought. But why football boots? But perhaps Mr. Glossop wishes to play football, sir. Yes, that may be the solution. Then, then, then why an Irish water spaniel? I fear I can hazard no conjecture, sir. What is an Irish water spaniel? A water spaniel of the variety bred in Ireland, sir. You think so? Yes, sir. Oh, well, perhaps you're right. Hello. Our busy morning, Jeeves. All right. I'll go this time. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, Aunt Delia. Bertie, I've come about that young hound, Glossop. All right, quite all right, Aunt Delia. I have the situation well in hand. The giant squirts and the luminous rabbit are even now being packed next door by Jeeves. I don't know what you're talking about. And I don't for a moment suppose you do either. But if you'll kindly stop gibbering, I'll tell you what I mean. 
I have had a most disturbing letter from Catherine about this glossop reptile. Of course, I haven't read the word to Angela. She hit the ceiling. Angela? Your cousin, Angela, has. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But, 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 but why should Angela hit the ceiling? Well, wouldn't you? If you were practically engaged to a fiend in human shape like this glossop, and then somebody told you he had gone off to the country and was flirting with a dog girl. With a what was that once again? A dog girl. One of these dashed open air flappers in thick boots and tailor made tweeds who infest the rural districts and go about the place hung by packs of assorted dogs. I used to be one of them myself in my younger days, so I know how dangerous they are. Her name is Dalgleish, old Colonel Dalgleish's daughter. They live near bleaching. Ah, that must be what his telegram was about. He's just wired, you see, asking me to bring down an Irish water spaniel. A Christmas present for this girl, no doubt. Probably. Catherine tells me he seems to be infatuated with her. There's something else, too. Just before he went to bleaching, he and Angela quarreled. I got it out of her this morning. She was crying her eyes out, poor angel. It was something about her new hat. As far as I could gather, he told her it made her look like a Pekingese. And she told him she never wanted to see him again in this world or the next. And he said, right ho, and breezed off. I can see what has happened. This dog girl has caught him on the rebound, and unless something is done quick, anything may happen. So place the facts before Jeeves and tell him to take action the moment you get down there. Jeeves' services will not be required, Aunt Elia. What on earth do you mean? I can handle this business. It is my intention to insert the luminous rabbit in Tuppy's room at the first opportunity that presents itself. It will sound to him like the voice of conscience, and I anticipate that a single treatment will make him retire to a nursing home for a couple of weeks at least. At the end of which period, he would have forgotten all about the ballet girl. Okay. Yes? You are the abysmal chump. Listen to me. It's simply because I am fond of you and have influence with the lunacy commissioners that you weren't put in a padded cell years ago. Bungle this business and I withdraw my protection. Can't you understand that this thing is far too serious for any fooling about? Angela's whole happiness is at stake. Do as I tell you and put it up to Jeeves. Just as you say, Aunt Ella. All right, then. Do it now. had not exaggerated the perilous nature of the situation was made clear to me on the following afternoon. Jeeves and I drove down to Bleaching in the two-seater, and we were touring along about halfway between the village and the court, when suddenly there appeared ahead of us a sea of dogs, and in the middle of it, young Tuppy frisking round one of those largish corn-fed girls. He was bending towards her in a devout sort of way, and even at a considerable distance, I could see that his ears were pink. There was, in addition... A marked resemblance to a stuffed frog. I drove straight by, more or less aghast at the sight. And it was not until he appeared in my room while I was dressing for dinner that I managed to confront him. Ah! Oh. Tuppy. Hello. Hello, Bertie. Ha <laughs> I, uh, I saw you, uh, this afternoon. Um, <laughs> who was the girl? Girl? Yes, yes. With the dogs. Down the road. Oh, yes, um, uh, Miss Dalglish. I say, Bertie, did you bring my football boots? Yes, yes, Jeeves has got them somewhere. And the water spaniel? Sorry, sorry, no water spaniel. Oh, dash, nuisance, she set her heart on an Irish water spaniel. Well, what do you care? I wanted to give her one. Why? Colonel and Mrs. Dalglish have been extremely kind to me since I got here. They have entertained me. And if people ask you to lunch and tea and whatnot, they appreciate it if you make them some little present in return. Well, give them your football boots. In passing, why do you want the bally things? I'm playing in a rugby match next Thursday. Upper Bleaching versus Hockley come Meston. Apparently, it's the big game of the year. <laughs> How did you get roped in? Well, I happened to mention in the course of conversation the other day that when in London, I generally turn out on Saturday for the old Austinians and Miss Dalglish seemed rather keen that I should help the village. Oh, gee. Miss Earl. Mr. Worcester tells me you have my football boots. Yes, I uh, have placed them in your room. Thanks. See you at dinner, Bertie. <laughs> Mr. Glossop is going to play on Thursday, Jeeves. So I was informed in the servants' hall, sir. Oh? What's the general feeling there about it? Yeah, the impression I gathered, sir, was that the servants' hall considers Mr. Glossop ill-advised. Why that? Yeah, I am informed by Mr. Mulready, Sir Reginald's butler, sir. 
But this contest differs in some respects from the ordinary football game. The primary object of the players, I am given to understand, is not so much to score points as to inflict violence. Good Lord, he That appears to be the case, sir. The game is one that would have a great interest for the antiquarian. It was played first in the reign of King Henry VIII, when it lasted from noon till sundown over an area covering several square miles. Seven deaths resulted on that occasion. Seven deaths, sir. Not inclusive of two of the spectators, sir. The opinion of the servants' hall is that it would be more judicious on Mr. Glossop's part were he to refrain from mixing himself up in the affair. Golly, Chief. Yes, sir. Additionally, I believe there is a certain amount of resentment amongst the men of Hockley that Mr. Glossop is participating at all in what is essentially a local feud. This may give rise to his receiving uh, <coughs> preferential treatment, sir. Gosh, Chief, this is sick. Yes. I mean, dash it, all deep as my resentment is for the ghastly outrage he's perpetrated on me, I've no wish to see young Tubby carried off on a stretcher in half a dozen pieces. No, sir. I think I'd better buzz off right away and put him in possession of the facts. That would be a kindly act, sir. Right so, then. So what you'd better do, Tubby, and the servants' hall think the same, is fake a sprained ankle on the eve of the match. Bertie, you suggest. That when Miss Dalgleish is trusting me, relying on me, looking forward with eager, girlish enthusiasm to seeing me help her village on to victory, I should let her down with a thud. That's the idea. Four. Four. As in golf, you mean? Bertie, what you tell me merely makes me all the keener for the fray. A warm game is what I want. It will enable me to go all out and give my best. Do you realize that she will be looking on? And do you know how that will make me feel? It will make me feel like some knight of old jousting under the eyes of his lady. Bertie, I may as well tell you that I'm in love at last. This is the real thing. I have found my mate. How different she is from those hot house, artificial London girls. Would they stand in the mud on a winter afternoon watching a football match? Would they know what to give an Alsatian for fits? Would they tramp ten miles a day across the field and come back as fresh as paint? No. Well, why should they? Bertie, I'm staking everything on this game on Thursday. When she sees me going through the opposition like a devouring flame, won't that make her think of it? Won't that make her open her eyes? What? What? I said, what? So did I. I meant, won't it? Oh. Rather... day before the match, I paid a visit to Hockley cum to take a look at the inhabitants and see how formidable they were. I was shocked to observe that practically every second male might have been the village blacksmith's big brother. The muscles of their brawny arms were almost as strong as iron bands, and the way the company at the Green Pig, where I looked in incognito for a spot of beer, talked about the forthcoming sporting contest was enough to chill the blood of anyone who had a pal who proposed to fling himself into the fray. I went back to Jeeves with my mind made up. There was a fellow with red hair at the green pit this afternoon who might have been the undertaker's partner the way he talked. We, we must act and speedily, Jeeves. We must put a bit of a jerk in it and save young Tuppy in spite of himself. What course would you advocate? Ah, <laughs> I'll tell you. We must employ guile. Yeah. You must go up to London today, Jeeves, and tomorrow morning you will send a telegram signed Angela, which will run as follows. Jot it down. Ready? Yes, sir. <clears throat> so sorry. Ah. Ah, ah, ah. What would a girl say, Jeeves, who, having had a row with a bird she was practically engaged to because he told her she looked like a Pekingese in her new hat, wanted to extend the olive branch? So sorry I was cross, sir. Would I fancy be the expression? Strong enough, do you think? Possibly the addition of the word darling would give the necessary verisimilitude. Oh. Mm -hmm. All right, yes. Resume the jotting. So sorry, I was cross, darling. I... No, 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 no. Wait, Chief, wait. Scratch that out. I see where we are missing a chance to make this the real Tabasco. Sign the telegram, not Angela, but Trevor. Very good. Hmm? Or, or rather, D. 
Dahlia Traveller, and this is the body of the communication, please return at once. Immediately would be more economical, sir. Only one word. And uh, it has a stronger ring. True, true. Jot on, then. Please return immediately. Angela, in a hell of a state. I would suggest seriously ill. Huh? All right. Angela, seriously ill. Keeps calling for you and says you were quite right about that. If I might suggest, sir. Oh, well, go ahead. I fancy the following would meet the case. Please return immediately. Angela, seriously ill, high fever and delirium, keeps calling your name piteously and saying something about a hat and that you were quite right. Please catch earliest possible train, Dahlia Travers. Sounds all right. Yes. Uh, well, send it off in time to get here at 2.30. Yes. Uh, <laughs> 2.30, Jeeves. You, uh, you see the... Devilish cunning. No, sir. I will tell you. If the telegram arrived earlier, Tuppy would get it before the game. By 2.30, however, he would have started for the ground. I shall send it to him the moment there's a lull in the battle. By that time, the poor lizard will have begun to get some idea of the carnage involved, and the thing ought to work like magic. You follow me? Yes, sir. Very good, then, Jeeves. Very good. There had been a great deal of rain in the last few days, and when I arrived at the pitch the following afternoon, the going appeared to be a bit sticky. In fact, I've seen swamps that were drier than this particular bit of ground. I got there just as the whistle blew, and the red-haired bloke whom I'd encountered in the pub paddled up and kicked off. The ball went straight to Tuppy. He caught it neatly and hoofed it back, and he was still standing there, looking modest, when the red-haired bird galloped up, seized him by the neck, hurled him to earth, and fell on him. I had a glimpse of Tuppy's face as it registered horror and dismay, and then he disappeared into the juice. By the time he'd come to the surface, two assortments of sons of the soil had got their heads down and were indulging in a sort of shoving bee on the other side of the field. Tuppy wiped a fair portion of Hampshire out of his eye, peered round him in a dazed kind of way, saw the mass meeting, and ran towards it, arriving just in time for a couple of heavyweights to gather him in and give him the mud treatment again. The red-haired man then fell off him. In fact, it was beginning to look as though my delivery of the telegram would be too late to save a human life when an interruption occurred. A sizable cove in what had once been a white shirt fell to earth, and a hearty cheer went up from a hundred patriotic folks as the news spread that upper bleaching had drawn first blood. The moment had come, it seemed to me, to remove Tuppy from the abattoir. I hopped over the ropes and toddled to where he sat, scraping mud from his wishbone. He was already so crusted with alluvial deposits that one realized how little a mere bath would be able to effect. To fit him to take his place once more in polite society, he would certainly have to be sent to the cleaners. Indeed, it was a moot point whether it wouldn't be simpler just to throw him away. I say, happy old man. Uh, eh? What? Telegram for you. Eh? Eh? A telegram to come for you. I think it may be important. Ah. Do you suppose I'm trying to read telegrams now? This, 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 this one is frightfully urgent to you. Very urgent indeed. Now, here it is. Oh, uh, oh, uh, I, 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 I
After that interruption, he became the life and soul of the party. Scored the winning try and all that, don't you know? A star of the game, in fact. I can't see the girl not being all over him. Unless I'm greatly mistaken, the moment they meet, she will exclaim, my hero, and fall into his belly arms. Indeed. Hmm? Oh, Puppy, why haven't you changed? Whiskey. Bring me one, Jeeves. A large one. Very good. Huh? What's the matter? Ah, nothing much. My faith in woman is dead, that's all. Women are a washout. I see no future for the sex, Bertie. Blisters, all of them. Uh, oh, uh, even the dog's body girl? Her name is Dalgleish, if it happens to interest you. And if you want to know something else, she's the worst of the lot. My dear chap, she wasn't there, Bertie. Well, at the match, you silly ass. <laughs> Not at the match. No. But I thought the whole scheme of the thing was... So have... did I. My gosh. For her sake, I allow a mob of homicidal maniacs to kick me in the ribs and stroll about on my face, and then I find that she didn't bother to come and watch the game at all. She got a phone call from London from somebody who said he'd located an Irish water spaniel, and up she popped in her car, leaving me flat. And to think I fancied I loved a girl like that. Why, if a man married a girl like that and happened to get stricken by some dangerous illness, would she smooth his pillow and press cooling drinks upon him? Not a chance. She'd be off somewhere trying to buy Siberian eel hounds. I am through with women. Oh. Ah, uh... My, uh... My cousin, Angela's. Oh, you're a bad egg. If you look at her squarely, something... Angela. Don't talk to me about Angela. Angela's a rag and a bone and a hank of hair and an A1 scourge, if you want to know. She gave me the push at 4.16pm on Tuesday the 17th. Oh, uh, by the way, old man, I found a telegram. What telegram? Uh, uh, the one I told you about. Oh, well, let's have a look at the beastly thing. <laughs> uh, um, uh, is any, any, um, uh, anything important? Bertie... My recent remarks for your cousin, Angela, wash them out. Cancel them. Look on them as not spoken. I tell you, Bertie, Angela's all right. An angel in human shape, and that's official. I've got to get up to London. She's ill. Ill? High fever and delirium. Can I borrow your car? Of course. Thanks. Ah, oh, Jeeves. Goodbye. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. He's gone to see my cousin, Angela Jeeves. The sun is once more shining. What? Extremely gratifying. Was it you, Jeeves, who phoned to Miss What's Her Belly Name about the alleged water spaniel? Yes. I thought as much. I recognized your touch. You knew she would come buzzing up. Yes. Uh -huh. it's one, just one point, though, Jeeves. What will Mr. Glossop say when he finds my cousin Angela full of beans and not delirious? Yeah, the point had not escaped me, sir. I took the liberty of ringing Mrs. Travers up on the telephone and explaining the circumstances. All will be in readiness for Mr. Glossop's arrival. Jeeves, you think of everything. Yes, sir. In Mr. Glossop's absence, would you care to drink this whiskey and soda? No, Jeeves, I would not. There's only one man who must do that. It is you. If ever anyone earned a refreshing snort, you are he. Pour it out, Jeeves, and shove it down. Thank you very much, sir. Cheerio, Jeeves. Cheerio. Huh? If I may use the expression. <laughs> The ordeal of young Tuppy, the parts were played as follows. Jeeves, Michael Gordon, Bertie, Richard Bryars, Aunt Dahlia, Vivian Pickles, Tuppy Glossop, Stephen Moore. P.G. Woodhouse's short story was adapted for radio by Chris Miller. The program was produced by Simon Brett. Michael Horton is a national theatre player. Stephen Moore is now appearing in Dirty Linen at the Arts Theatre Club, London.